I'm joined today by two of the top competitors in the college circuit and in the law school circuit over the last uh, bunch of years. Why don't you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves? Hi, uh, I'm Steven Johnson. I'm a 3L on UCLA Law's trial team. Hi, I'm Jonathan. I uh, am a 3L on Harvard's law school mock trial team. So you're both in your, your last year of law school um, and in your, your last year of competing on any kind of mock trial team. Uh, how does that make you guys feel that you're almost at the finish line, not only of kind of your educational career, but of your, your law school competition career? Thanks for reminding me, I guess. Uh, I, I, try to, I try to push off thinking about that as much as I can. Uh, this is my, my 12th and last year, which is as many as they'll let you get away with. And I, uh, I don't want to be done with it. So I'm sure, I'll, I'm sure I'll have to stay involved in some way. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, uh, it's pretty sad to think that if we ever do a trial again in the real world, it will have real, real consequences, real stakes. Uh, I think one of the cool things about mock trials, you can just like do all this dumb stuff and no one really gets hurt in the end. Uh, on the broader question of the last year of law school, that's also kind of sad because that means working like a nine to five or a nine to nine, depending on where you're going after law school. Uh, so yeah, very sobering, not the same as undergrad for sure. So there are lots of competitors who have been you know, all Americans, excellent collegiate competitors. And there are some who have been really, really successful law school competitors, but there's not many people who have been incredibly high level college competitors and very, very high level law school competitors. And the two of you have, have absolutely achieved that already, regardless of what happens in the spring. What would you say is kind of the, the biggest difference between college mock trial and law school mock trial? And which do you like better and why? I think it really is more substance driven. I think I've noticed, like, I mean, I'm sure Stephen will talk about this, but like UCLA, like they got really, really clean content. I mean, we hit you guys last weekend, Phil, and, and you guys also had really clean content. I think attorneys care more about that. But I don't know if it's like a law school thing or more maybe a Zoom thing too, because I think presentationally, kind of the presence you might have in person, those things are limited over like a Zoom screen where I don't know, people, are, I don't even know if everyone's just like watching the round the entire time. Like, I know if I was judging a Zoom mock trial round, it'd be hard to just stare at the screen the entire time without, I don't know, if I'm like checking emails or something like that at the same time. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's, I think that's good in some ways because I think, you know, it lets you think more about like your case theory. And I've seen teams that like were definitely presentationally stronger and they just lost because the attorneys didn't like the case theory, which I don't think that happens as often in law in undergrad mantra because you have like character witnesses and all these other things that might carry you to a win. But yeah, those are my thoughts. Yeah, I, I tend to prefer the law school mock trial for a couple of reasons. I think one of the biggest differences is that it is more substance driven, like John said, and far less theatrical than your standard amped mock trial. If you watch one round, you'll notice that the attorneys sound a lot like real people in uh, law school trials, much more so that, than an AMTA. And they're a lot more casual and, and it is a lot more substance driven. So the judging is, is much more based on your theory and whether you're actually meeting uh, your burden of proof and putting together a good case than presentationally how you're doing. And if you watch a, a lot of law school mock trials, I think what you would notice is the difference is in the level of competition as well. I think at the law school level, the median is much higher. Like if you go to a regional at, at a national competition in law school, I think everybody's going to be solid or most everybody's going to be solid. I think at the top, the teams are relatively similar when it comes to law school trial teams and, and college trial teams in their ability to present and put a case together. But uh, there's a lot more just really solid, great teams in law school. So I've enjoyed that more. Yeah, I think to me, the biggest difference between the law school teams and the college teams is the college teams tend to be more dynamic and the law school teams tend to be more substantive. And so a lot of times you'll watch college teams. And now that I'm a, a, a real lawyer, I, I watch those rounds and I think you can't say that, or like that would never happen in a real trial or that is like 
not the law or like whatever the case may be. Um, but I also think the, to use the example that you gave uh, Steve a minute ago, the average team at regionals in, in, that, at AMTA and on an AMTA competition would probably do just fine at an average law school competition because they're such good performers on balance. Um, and I think that's one area where law school can do better is, is focusing more on the kind of performance-based skills that we teach our students. But I also think the, the college teams could learn from watching some really good law school teams in terms of the substance and in theory decisions and things like that. I do want to ask you about your individual teams before we, before we get into the round we're going to watch. Um, so two weeks ago, my team uh, actually had the misfortune in the preliminary rounds of playing not uh, just one of your teams, but both of your teams in the tournament of champions TOC, which for those of you who are watching, don't know what it is. That's the biggest law school invitational there is um, in the fall. It's kind of like the law school equivalent of, of Gamty, I would say. Um, Steve's uh, UCLA team won. We, we drew them in round one and then went on to win the tournament. Um, and they were just you know, excellent. Just like every UCLA team is just so, so, so good. Um, Steve, you've now won the biggest law school invitational and you also won the biggest college invitational in, in trial by combat. Uh, which of those two wins is more important to you? The last one, TFC. I told Justin that right after. He asked me, is this your biggest win other than trial by combat and mock trial? And I said, no, this is my biggest win. Uh, and I think that my reaction is pretty indicative of that. Like, I think the team national championship just meant more. Um, if you watch the video, I, I literally jump out of my chair and run out of the room. Uh, whereas in trial by combat, I just kind of stand up and very straight faced, except a, a weird trophy. Uh, I, I like this last one more. It was more satisfying. John, you, um, one of the, I say that other big difference between law school and in college mock trial is most law school teams have attorneys who are full-time coaches and most college teams, at least in my view, are, are, are student run as far as I know, at least, um, you are, your school is one of the few schools at, at, at Harvard that is a student run high level law school mock trial team. What's it like being on um, a really good student run law school team, especially when you're at these big tournaments that have coaches and full-time directors of trial ad who are working day in and day out to get their teams ready when you guys are kind of doing it on your own. What's that like? I think it's very different from my undergrad experience because I was at UCLA and UCLA has like a lot of institutional strength, a lot of coaches that have been there for like a long, long time. I think Gonzalo has been there like since the beginning. Um, and so in, in that sense, I think it's, it, it really varies from year to year, like what the team is like, because it's not driven by any sort of like institutional coach or structure or even a board that, that stays the same all, all the time it's changing. It's driven more just by who's on your team um and like you know the, the four participants on the team are the ones who are dictating what practices look like what theories we're going for what strategic decisions we're making um and so to say that you know harvard mock trial is like this i think it would really just depend on, on the variation of the team so like i can tell you about the toc team uh but it, it was very different from the toc team that we sent last year or, or two years before that and i think that sort of lack of structure is very different. I think it's freeing to some extent because, you know, we have one else competing and I know most law schools don't allow one else to compete. And I think another thing that it allows for is flexibility and kind of scheduling as well, because oftentimes people that are competing are also very busy doing other things. Uh, law school is like a really cool time to just explore a lot of different resources. Um, and so I remember in undergrad, you know, we would practice like for nationals, it'd be like every, every day of the week for like so, so many hours. And like, we just sit there and, and school would suffer and all that. And I think the approach, at least at a school that doesn't have a coach and that is more student driven and, and people are just doing it uh, more because they, you know, loved it in college or are interested in law school. I think it's a bit more laid back in terms of how we're approaching it, how we're scheduling practices, like how much effort is actually going into it. And, and of course that varies from team to team. Uh, but I would say like in terms of mediums, that's, that's what it looks like as well. So one of the things that we do at Drexel is we have, um, you guys may know, but some of the people watching may not, we have what's called a courtroom scholarship, which is a scholarship specifically designed for uh, 
former AMSA competitors who are applying to law school. And we make it a point to recruit law school uh, AMSA competitors to our, to our trial team. And we've done that, um, you know, to, 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 with a lot of success over the last couple of years, especially for your two programs. I mean, the, the names in your programs right now are just, you, people won't believe it unless you see all of you in the same room together. I mean, John, your partner last weekend, um, uh, Sonali, who was our 2020 trial by combat champion. I mean, I didn't want to tell the, the, the students that were going into the round against you guys who they were about to fly. I, I waited till after the round to tell them you guys about your guys' credentials because I didn't want to freak them out. But and, and last year, your TOC team, Matt Besman and, and Stephen Becker and Joy Holden and, and, and Steve, your UCLA team, uh, just at this tournament, Natalie Garson and Regina Campbell, and the list at UCLA goes on and on and on and on. Uh, Sarah Stebbins, uh, Enrico Trevisani, Sydney Gaskins is a 1L at UCLA. I mean, we could spend this entire episode just naming all the people at your schools who are excellent. What's it like being on teams that have just such stacked rosters with all these superstars and, and big names of kind of amped up past and present? Yeah, I feel like you should go first. I feel like UCLA is like, I don't know, it's like the Avengers right now. <laughs> like, everyone has their own TV show. Everyone has their own backstory over there. <laughs> All right. I mean, I, I think you have the better part of a dozen TVC competitors at your school right now. So I, that, yeah, I, I'll take it first though. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. Every time one of my teammates stands up to do any performance, I'm never worried. Uh, when you're on a college team, that's not, it's not always hundred percent the case. Like you might have one, you know, one competitor that's not great or something like that. It's, there are no weak points in any team. So it's so much fun. And it's not just fun in the rounds. It's always the, the prep, everyone coming to practice so passionate about pursuing different theories and having these long drawn out arguments about whether or not we're going to use this specific piece of evidence. It's so fun to be around a group of people that are that passionate about it and that talented. So I, I mean, I've enjoyed it a lot. It's, it's just been great. Yeah, I, I thought that was something that was really cool that AMTA ended up doing after we graduated was the one last time tournament where you can kind of like team up with people from other schools. And I, I imagine this is kind of what it feels like if you're to like team up with like, you know, that rival attorney that you always like trade ranks with and they were just on your team, for instance. I think that's kind of what, it, what it's like. It's just everyone's very good, very passionate, like Sue was saying. A lot of egos too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think that's like one of the, like I, I don't want to let you guys off easy here. You're you're on a yeah. team with some really really talented, accomplished people, both of you, and I imagine that's got to be. It's obviously great for all the reasons you're both saying, but it's also got to be hard to in some ways because for both of you, you were the you were superstars on your college teams, and you're you're still superstars on your team, but there are other superstars that you're kind of sharing the spotlight with in lots of ways. Um, is that, a, do you ever find that challenging? I think it's been challenging, but it's been fun kind of reinventing a different role. I feel like when you're the, the star on your college team, you're always crossing the defendant and giving the big speech, whether that's the, you know, the open or the close on whatever given side it is. And you're directing like either the, the police officer, the expert or the plaintiff, whatever it is, but uh, it's been kind of fun to have more of a Swiss army knife role. Like when I was on this team at TOC with Regina Campbell, I want her crossing the defendant and giving the closing argument. I, I'm not going to be able to do that as well as she can. So I'm going to direct and cross a character and give an opening statement that hopefully can carry us through the trial. And I, I, I've enjoyed that. It's been, yes, it's been challenging, but it's been fun. Um, and I don't know any of the disagreements that we have in practice we always work out and I feel like everybody's just been respectful regardless of, of how passionate we are about some of the dis those uh, disagreements. John, what was it like work working with Sonali? Did she, uh, did she make, did she say any, like make fun of you or anything for, because she won trial by combat and you were in second? <laughs> uh, no, Sonali's much nicer than that. I definitely would have done that if, if the roles were reversed for sure. Uh, Sonali, Sonali is great. I think, especially like in the zoom mock trial setting she really knows her stuff like she did like trial by combat and like the what's it called one last time torrent and all that was over zoom so I, I really learned a lot about zoom mock trial from her like demos and, and how important they are and how they're three points apparently um 
and yeah, I, I think it was just like amazing to see like the sort of theories that you would come up with, the the cross examination. I, our objections are also spot on, and then, you know, we ended up not making it to the semifinals of that tournament. And I think also something that was that was really cool was, you know, I take losing really hard. I tried my best in, in my undergrad career not to lose too much, and so when I lost, it, it was very very down. And I remember just like right after the tournament, Sonali and I were just talking about you know. Like, what can we do better? Like, why did we lose that round? Uh, how do we make sure we don't lose that round in the, in the future for whatever tournaments come during spring semester? So I, I think that sort of drive was good. And, and to the question of challenges, I mean, I think in undergrad, I was a bit different than like the prototypical, like 39 rank All-American Steven Johnson and that like, I didn't ever do like the big uh, party opponent crosses. I was more, more often put on like the character crosses you know, make jokes about their jokes, that sort of thing. Uh, just have a good time with them. Um, so, so that that's actually been kind of nice in the pairings because I just take the character or like the not party uh, rep, and and then Sonali or whoever else I'm paired with ends up taking the the big series cross. Um, so that's actually worked out quite well. Yeah, John had a really fun moment in in the uh, the fourth round of, of tournament champions two weeks ago, it, and, and we had who some people may know are watching this, Nihir Nanavati, who is an award-winning witness from UMBC. He mm-hmm. was played our, our character witness in the case, and he was an eyewitness. And um, part of this witness's backstory is that he was uh, high at the time of the shooting. And um, John cross-examined him, and John said, yeah, you went out on the balcony because you were, uh, you were coughing. And Nahir said, yeah, you know, when you, when you smoke a lot, you cough a lot. And John was like, when you smoke a lot, you cough a lot. Is that what you just said, sir? And Nahir was like, well, no, I didn't mean, he was like, no, no, no. You said, when you smoke a lot, you cough a lot. So you were smoking a lot, weren't you? And Nahir was like, yeah, I was smoking a lot. Uh, and it was awesome. So actually the character witness stuff can be even more fun depending on uh, the witness in the case. And I always found that stuff challenging too. Definitely um, a different skill set, I think. To like Absolutely. make points out of nothing uh, in undergrad because because you still gotta you're still scored on the same range uh, but you just don't have as many hard hitting points as the defending cross. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna watch uh, a couple parts of the 2019 trial by combat final that you two were in, um, and it really is just such a high level round, obviously. Um, and I went I watched it back before this, and the two of you were just so 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 good in in the round, and it was a really close round in terms of the ballots from what I remember. Uh, it was definitely a split decision. I don't remember what the exact ballot count was. Um, but so we're going to watch, John, your opening statement, um, and we're going to watch Steve's cross of the defendant. So we're going to get into this. Um, and before we start, I just got to take a second. This is Trial by Combat 2019, and the courtroom that you're looking at is the ceremonial courtroom um, at uh, in Center City, Philadelphia, where our trial teams at Drexel practice. So if you want to practice or compete in this courtroom, uh, you can message me. Um, maybe we can make that happen. Um, I think we're really nice because because the bottom rooms too, they have like this setting where you can frost the windows, right? Or something like that. That's right. Yeah. So the, the first floor. the craziest thing I saw. Yeah. So the backstory to this, build, this building is it was an old bank. Mm. And so... That's- my, my boss, um, Tom Klein, who I now work for, um, donated, um, made a big donation to the school. And part of that donation was this building. And um, they converted this old bank in Center City, Philadelphia to a basically like a cathedral to, to mock trial. There are five or six courtrooms. This is the, the, the ceremonial courtroom. And the courtroom that you're talking about is on the first floor of the building, and it's called the vault. And there's literally, I don't know if it was always there or if they like preserved it and put it there. But if you go into the room, there's literally like a bank, like a big vault in the back of the courtroom. And um, you can, uh, like, it's like a fishbowl room and you can frost the windows. So you can't see in if you, if you don't want to. But there's and on any given night when we're in person, if you walk into that building on the first floor, you can see a team practicing in there. And it's really, it's really cool to have this building um to practice in to get ready for competitions in to host tournaments in so just like a little like plug for drexel there uh i I didn't want to go uh forget to mention that 
So we're about to watch John's opening statement. So Steve just gave the opening. Before we get into this, this was the last round, obviously, of a pretty grueling couple of days. For those of you who don't know, this is a 24-hour preparation. You show up, you get the case 24 hours before round one, um, and then you just go. Um, how are you guys feeling heading into this round in terms of your stamina and fatigue and things like that? Were you just exhausted? I remember being pretty exhausted. Uh, I think, you know, Sonali was like telling me about like TBC her year. And I, I think the entire time I was just thinking it was so different for them and like the most previous year, because I think they have like second chairs now or something like that, that can, that can write things for them and like do technology or, or whatever for them. And so that's like, that's like another person that Steve and I, we didn't have that. Like it was just me and my coach and we just had 24 hours together and it was in person. So you couldn't just like read off your screen, which is what I apparently heard. Like everyone just re read off their screen for TVC last year. And so like you had to spend, first you had two people instead of three writing stuff. And then you had to memorize everything. So the first night I remember I had, I got two hours of sleep just because I like went to bed at two and then woke up at four to start memorizing things. Um, and that was just the most awful day of my life because we had three rounds that day as well. Um, and I remember I like fumbled the burden, like every single time I tried to do an opening statement and I hit Sydney, like my first attorney round and she, she got eight hours of sleep because apparently she always gets eight hours of sleep no matter what. And she was just very alive and I was not, not alive at all. And then I think before this round, the, the second day. I think I got, I did get five hours of sleep that night and I, I felt like it was like the most amount of sleep. I, it, it was just like five hours is too much sleep, honestly. I, I felt spoiled at that point. But yeah, it, it was at the end of a very, very long weekend for me. Yeah, yeah, that was a very long weekend. I, I don't have much to add there other than a slight correction that you get the case 23 hours before the beginning of the first round. That's right. It's a 10 a.m. to 9 a.m. process. I just always feel the need to make that clarification. But yes, it's it's exhausting to write two sides of a case with only two people in a hotel room and then do all four roles uh, throughout the course of the weekend and then get told at the end of that, you actually have to do it again. And then at the end of that, you get told you have to do it again. So I guess we can watch the product of, of that exhaustion here. I can't believe you did it twice because you did it the year before too, right? I, I remember did. right after I was like, I don't like, even if you told me I was going to win next year, I, I don't know if I could do this again, just because of like how, how much pain there was in terms of like lack of sleep and just, just feeling exhausted the entire time and getting pushed. But yeah. Opening statement from the defense, your honor. Proceed. Eli Watt is a criminal that cannot be trusted. I ripped that from uh, the Top Gun final the, the year before. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. I was going to ask you that because that was in, in, in 15 they used that theme. It's an effective theme. I don't mind. Sometimes you don't need to recreate the wheel. Yeah, I mean. It's true. Yeah. Although the guy that wrote it is just outside of the panel there on the left. <laughs> which i thought was a fun move but yeah no that's uh rahul's theme it's yeah, he, incredibly effective and i've seen it probably you know a thousand like, times since time, then maybe. <laughs> i'm sorry yeah. i'm sure everyone like there's probably thousands of people across the country have used that theme since uh uh yeah definitely i didn't think about that like he's in the room and you're bite, you're biting his theme it's kind of kind of gutsy but it's why you're in the final i mean yeah <laughs> They told you that my client paid Mr. Watt to beat her. Today you'll learn that the weapon with which she was beaten was this pipe. I'm holding this pipe around a couple feet above the ground. Did you hear that? Did you hear how heavy that pipe is? All right, so this is one of the more memorable things in the round that you can't see right now, but I was sitting on the right side of the jury box in this round. And I remember when you did that, I was like, it was, it was startling. Like I was like, I jumped. Had you done that in other rounds or was this the first time you did it? 
So I did it for the first time actually in semis because admittedly this was not my idea fully. I I watch I had the pleasure of witnessing the Regina versus Sabrina Grandi yeah, Sabrina Grandi round four, like attorney, like top pair matchup. And Sabrina did this thing where she like tapped the pipe against the table. And I think it was in this courtroom too. And I was like, oh, that's like, that's like kind of cool. Like, Cause she was like tapping it to like show how loud it was. And I was like, but what if we added the West Coast flavor to it, the UCLA flavor to it <laughs> and just full dropped it. So so during the semifinal round, I didn't do it during the opening actually. I just did it during the closing and then it like went over really well. So I was like, I'm just gonna do it in everything. <laughs> So I can win as many check marks as possible. Um, but yeah, I, I was kind of afraid of like denting the floor too, because it, it the, the mic actually carried that pretty well. I didn't know how well it would carry it, but that sounded yeah. kind of loud. <laughs> so Steve, you're like a foot away from that. Did you jump? Were you like kind of like startled when he did that? No, I think I kind of saw what was coming uh, when he picked <laughs> yeah. up the pipe. I had actually competed against Sabrina Grandi's defense just the round prior. Um, so I had seen pipe chicanery by, by that point. Uh, but no, that was, um, I didn't jump, but internally I was like, wow, that was, that was the sound of seven check marks right there. <laughs> Fantastic. That the weapon with which she was beaten was this pipe. And I'm holding this pipe around a couple feet above the ground. Hear that? Did you hear how heavy that pipe is? Today, members of the jury, the government wants you to believe that my client, Miss Rivers Leaphart, paid a man to beat her with that pipe. Is that you writing the flip down, Stephen? Yep. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I was writing the, the P close portion on that right yeah. there. Yeah. And and by the way, the um the uh Mock trial memes for Salty Teams group has been pretty receptive to things I've said on the on the show. And so my request this time is I want someone to um create a meme of Steve's pet folio there in the center of the screen here. Like some kind of meme with like a pet a pet folio related thing. So just a request and see what you can do with it. Um and uh we'll we'll look at it then. Instead, the only thing that you will learn from today's trial is that Eli White is a criminal that cannot be trusted. There is one thing that is undisputed in today's trial. On June 24, Mr. Watt assaulted my client. He waited in the alley near her home and at 11 p.m. he pulled her into an alley and struck her. Not once, not twice. Today you'll hear that he loses count of how many times he strikes Miss Leapheart. You'll learn that as a result, she suffers bruise after bruise, hairline fracture across her wrist. You'll learn that she's beaten so badly that she can hardly breathe. Members of the jury, at the end, the end of today's trial, what you will know is that that attack, it wasn't because of any sort of conspiracy, but it was because of a tweet. A tweet that Mr. Johnson talked about, a tweet that was controversial, that, that took a controversial stance on immigration. And you'll learn today that Mr. Watt, he had strong views on immigration, that him and Ms. Leapheart had opposite positions, polar opposite positions. So, John, one of the things that in a case like this I've seen people do is when you've got a defendant who does something that, at least to the majority of people, is um, bad, right? Taking a controversial stance on immigration or, you know, whatever the case may be. Acknowledging as the defense that that is a bad thing that they did. And saying, look, you know, we're not going to try to tell you that what Miss Leapheart did was okay or that it wasn't, that it wasn't insensitive. Um, we acknowledge that what she probably shouldn't have said that and we don't endorse her views. But this case isn't about her views. 
you took a different approach here and you decided you were, the way you framed it just there was they had opposite views, right? In other words, you're not endorsing one or the other. And I'm sure you, you probably, the, the, this character was not written in a way that they were likable or that you were supposed to endorse their views. But did you make a conscious decision to say, I'm not going to alienate someone on my scoring panel and uh, you know, condemn my, my client's views? Or did, was, that, was that even discussed with you and your coach? You know, I, I think it just wasn't something that was at the top of our minds at that time. I, just like background, I think on my defense case in chief, like I think my defense side was weaker up until semis, but then we just spent like the night before the, the second to last round or the last round just doing defense and like ripping off everything that we had seen that day because one of the cool things about TVC is like everyone's really, really good. I think in the closing or something, I say something like, you know, you might like hate that tweet. So I don't know if I ended up sticking with this path of like not really trying to alienate anyone. Um, it was a while ago. <laughs> so, so I don't remember exactly what my, my plan was going into that. I think my primary concern during that opening was just making sure I said everything that I needed to say and not like flubbing the, the burden. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know if it was a conscious decision on my part, but I, yeah. I like the way that you put it. You <laughs> told whole, me like, this isn't about views. You told me before we signed on that you hadn't seen this since. I mean, have you ever watched this? Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> I think uh, in like the year or so after it, I was uh, definitely stuck on it because I was like, oh, like what can I do better? And I actually, you know, def definitely have spent many a shower just like thinking about, <laughs> oh, what if I did this on cross or. Like, what if I did this on closing? Um, and it's it's been a while since I've seen it, though. I'm, I'm impressed with myself. I've been like, this is, this is not bad for five hours. <laughs> I, yeah, thought, I, I thought it would look like I was just start, trying to remember things, but I seem natural-ish, and I, I'm happy with it. That, that's why I haven't really been saying anything. I'm just, it's been a while. It's really cool to watch stuff back of yeah. yourself years later because you have such a different perspective on it. Mm. And now as a coach, I have a much different perspective on like my Top Gun round or just like other stuff. And, um, you did know, you I, win? I did. So you, but you still think about it. Oh, yeah. I actually like I'm pretty horrified that that is the only round on the internet that exists of me. Because um, oh. um, oh. I'm sure you two can relate to this. I was so exhausted. And I was just like doing things that I don't normally do, like slurring my words and misspeaking. And I was a little faster than I normally am. And um, it's just hard. Yeah. Like you're just, by that point, you're just um, like at this, at this point for you two, you're just so tired. And I remember like right before the live stream started at Top Gun, I was like on the side of the room eating like a something like something like a cliff bar. And just like, they were like, can we start the live stream yet? Can we start the live stream? Yet? And I was like, just give me a second. Just give me a second. Finished the cliff bar, threw it in the trash, sat in my seat, live stream. Like it was like that level of like, I'm so exhausted. Um, and so what, but watching it back, it's, you just have a, such a different perspective on it. It's really cool. Um, but it's, it's, I agree with you that I think, I think you're, you're awesome in this opening and the whole round. I like that school of thought that that's like TVC is not everyone's best because I, I know I've talked to one other TVC competitor, Steven Becker. And I think he's kind of salty about how his run ended. Um, I don't know if he'll end up watching this, but I think I what I had said was, uh, oh, like TVC isn't like really the measure of like you as, as a mock trial attorney. Like maybe like orcs is more a measure of that or like nationals like where you like where you prepared, like how you usually prepare an AMTA competition. And he like immediately leaped onto that. He was like, yeah, yeah, I've been trying right. to tell everyone like TVC is not, it's like, a, it's just like a different form of competition. I think especially like, 2019 2018 it, it was more in favor of like people that could go more off the cuff I think um maybe like more the undergrad style kind of harkening back to our conversation about like law school versus uh undergrad because I think law school is is definitely a lot of polish especially when you have like these full-time coaches that are are looking over your things um and I think this was not polish <laughs> uh Steven's stuff was very polished though <laughs> for sure um, but yeah, you know, I think it's just like a different metric almost for like, what is a, a good attorney? So it's, it's interesting to see like 
you take the top 16 people based off of like Anta style competitions where like people have coaches and they've looked at all these things for so long. And then you thrust them into like this sort of like 24 hour environment where like some of those strains that they might've had in those like long season, season long sort of competition prep don't necessarily show up in the same way, I think in like these sort of shorter competitions. He found that tweet offensive. He found that tweet to be strongly disagreeable, to be incorrect, and that in his outrage, in his anger, he takes that pipe and just five days later beats my client. That he was alone, that he acted alone in his assault of my client. By the end of today's trial, you will know that Eli Watt is a criminal that cannot be trusted. You see, while Mr. Johnson, he told you about the story that Mr. Watt's going to tell you, there are a couple things that he didn't tell you. He- What's your guys' take on using your opponent's name in speeches or in, or in exams? Exams? Oh, in, like, in, in, during the trial. Talking, like Mr. Johnson? Yeah, so in speeches or exams saying, you know, Mr. Johnson just said blah, 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 blah. Is that true? Like something like do you, like what, what, um, what's your, what are your thoughts on that as a, as a tactic? I think I prefer to call people by their name. Um, and like if I don't remember their name, then it's like defense counsel or government counsel. I think actually there's like one point in this trial where I say like, Mr. Government. <laughs> I don't know if that's accurate, but I feel like I remember getting a lot of not we shouldn't cuss on this, right? A, a lot of crap for that. Um, you, 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 you can curse. Oh, really? Um, yeah, just getting a lot of shit for that from my team. They're, they're like, why did you say Mr. Government? So maybe that is a point for like not using last names because then you might forget, whereas like the government is much easier. Steve, what, what's your take? I don't think you use John's name as much as he used yours. Was that deliberate? No, it wasn't at the time. I actually tended to use last names back then, but I've been since convinced otherwise. Uh, I think sometimes, especially when you're giving closing arguments uh, on the defense or, or if you're giving a rebuttal, if you're directly responding to someone's argument, it you run the risk of it sounding like you're attacking the person and not the argument. So I just... I try to avoid like even the perception of it being an ad hominem sort of argument. So for that reason, I, I try to avoid it now. Yeah, it feels personal when you use their name, I think. Um, and as, as a general rule, I like to attack witnesses and not the attorneys as a general rule. Um, and if I'm going to reference the attorneys, I, I'll say opposing counsel or defense counsel or state's counsel or plaintiff's counsel or whatever. I think I think you run the risk oh, of it sounding... Personal. Yeah, I think it is personal, but you don't want anyone to know it's personal. I don't know. I feel like it's different from real trial in that, like, it's not you trying to, like, advocate for your client. It's you trying to beat the other attorney. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I actually think in real life, it actually is a lot more personal than mock trial. I mean, I've mm. seen lawyers in the cases that I've tried, like, screaming at each other and with the judge there. And um, in some ways, it's very personal because there's, there's a lot of money on the line and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of stake for the clients and there's reputation on the line and all that stuff. And so it does get personal in our life sometimes, but as a general rule, I think reasonable minds can differ, but I like to keep the, the names out of it. I watch today. You'll learn that he's a convicted felon, that he's a convicted fraud. And today, most importantly, what you'll learn is that in exchange for his testimony, He'll be as free as you and me by the end of today's trial. That two weeks after the attack, he was caught. I don't know why, but saying it that way was just so persuasive. I had never heard someone, and there's a lot of plea deal witness rhetoric out there because they're so commonly used in these kinds of competitions. I had never heard someone say, uh, he'll be as free as you and me. Great line, John. I don't know where that came from. That stood out to me too. That stood out to me too, for sure. Um, the other thing, I think we're kind of glossing over it because it feels, it just looks so easy when you do it, but you do as good a job as almost anyone I've ever seen in terms of pacing, because you're really slow, but you're not like, like, come on, like speed it up. Like, let's go. 
you do a good job of being slow in between thoughts, but not being slow in terms of like word, 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 word. And I think there's lots of different ways to be um, effectively slow and you can pace in different ways that is persuasive. For example, Steve's teammate Enrico is one of the best per, uh, competitors in terms of pacing I've ever seen. He does this thing where he says like one word at a time sometimes. And it's so effective. And I think it only works for him, but yours is a little bit different. You're kind of slow in between your thoughts. And it's really good. The other thing that you do really well is you do a really good job with your volume. And in that line that we were just talking about, you get soft at the end. And it's very effective. Do you find that that's something that you had to work at a lot or just kind of the, the pacing and the tone and the volume kind of components of your speaking? Does that come natural to you? Yeah, no, I think especially in the mock trial context, that was something I, I had to work on because um, I, I had, had a debate background in high school. And so I think that led to me like really being really fast a lot of times. And I think that reflected a lot in my mock trial career because actually like even though I ended up, you know, getting to compete against Steven in, in the final round my senior year, like my first two years I was on our, our C team. I used to like I, I didn't move up. I, I didn't move down. I was just stuck there. Um, and so I think a lot of that was just trying to break through and like, like find a style, I guess. Um, and I think something I found was just pausing between thoughts was something that was easier to me than pausing between words, maybe. Um, and that gave the jury a, a bit more time to think about what I said. And I, I also think that, you know, having a long pause is something that really shows that you're comfortable, uh, especially like in, in physical mock trial where like, or I don't know if in real life mock trial, uh, in person mock trial. Um, I like, like real, real life mock trial. Let's go with that. <laughs> real life mock trial. Um, like where everyone is like looking at you and like nobody's like on their phones. Like everyone's just like watching you and you just like pause there and you don't say anything. I think if you can be comfortable with that sort of silence in that, in that pause, it, it really goes a long way with the jury and just like building your own confidence as well. And so I think that's how it ended up getting, getting built into my style. Um, there's, there's been a lot of, generally. there's been a lot of, a lot of really good people at UCLA, obviously before, I, before you and since you, who did you model your style after when you were there? <laughs> Zach Fields. <laughs> Not a UCLA competitor, Not but a UCLA okay. guy, yeah, Harvard guy. Um, I don't know. We, we have like a pretty extensive mock trial video library at UCLA. Um, and so I got shared it like before I even like was a freshman. Uh, and so I just like watched all the videos and I saw this Zach Fields guy who had just won nationals and, you know, was really decorated and everyone was like, he's like the best ever. Um, and I was like, I want to be the best ever too. Um, and so I think initially a lot of it was modeled after him. A lot of the substance of my closings, like I would use a lot of his like rhetorical fluff. Um, some of like his like cross-examination kind of structures, especially like with expert witnesses. I think later on, especially like my sophomore, junior year, I, I actually got coached by Vikram Iyer. Um, he, uh, he was a UCLA competitor like a while back. Um, I think he graduated a couple of years before I, I got there. And he was just attending UCLA Law. He's still working in the, in the UCLA area. And he ended up coaching our C team like just by himself that year. And I think he coached a lot of mannerisms into me, uh, a lot of mannerisms out of me. I think you had mentioned like speed and, and tone. I think I had an issue where I think while we like it now, where like sometimes I get quiet at the end, I would just get quiet at like the end of everything. And so it's just less impactful if it's happening all the time. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of my style came from, I remember like some of the other coaches were like, Vikram just made like a mini me. <laughs> right. So it's good to the next. And I think that that's a pretty fair place to get, to say I got my inspiration from. Steve, who are you bottling your game after? Ben Wallace. That's pretty simple. I'd seen those, those Top Gun videos and I thought that was the thing that I could try to do as close to as possible. As you can tell, I'm not a crazy theatrical person. And I think Ben's just so matter of fact and clean and always right. So I just tried to be as much like him as I could. And he's he was one of your you guys now. He was one of your coaches at TOC. What was what yeah. was that like working with Ben? He was. That was a great experience. Ben is as brilliant as you would expect in preparing different case theories and giving us substantive comments and everything. It was it was kind of everything I could have expected from it. It was really great. Uh, we got to work with him and Rahul, 
uh, were, were our coaches other than uh, <laughs> Justin at this last tournament. So that, that was a fantastic pair. Luckily, there wasn't as much competition, I guess, when, when they were together there. Right. I mean, they both won one, right? That, that's... They did. It's poetic. Feelings there. Right. Yeah. And I think if you watch, like, Ben's post-game uh, interview in 2016, which, by the way, like, when I went, I was like, the only thing I want, if, if, I, if I get lucky enough to win, I want the post-game interview. And then they just, like, they did it, and then it never came out. But Ben's post-game interview is on YouTube. And I think he said... Um, like it just feels right that uh, Rahul wins one and I win one. Um, and it's uh, that was a cool way to end it for the two of them. What did they ask you during the post game interview? I, I was so tired, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what I said. Um, or what it, they asked me, I really don't know. Like the usual stuff, like what's it feel like, and that kind of thing. Um, what are you gonna do next? Right, I'm going to Disney Go to World. Disneyland. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I actually think I went to me and Justin in my second chair went to in and out. Hmm. Well, and, similar. Yeah. And then I fell asleep and then I went home. That was it. <laughs> that was nothing crazy. It's like whenever you win something, like I'm sure you guys have had this experience. You're always like, we're going to win and then we're going to go out and it's going to be a crazy night and we're going to bring the trophy. And then inevitably, like everyone is just tired and goes to bed. It's usually what happens. I remember I went to a pizza place after, after the round. What you after do? this round? Yeah, yeah. What, what pizza was place sweating. was it? Uh, was it good? You, let's use this as a chance to plug Drexel. So you you walked out of the beautiful courtroom. Oh and yeah, went I walked down the out street. Of the beautiful courtroom, down like the beautiful, perfect stairs, across the you know really cushy uh, uh, rug with with like something I think I referenced in closing. I feel like I talked about the words on the rug. Uh, the carpet um, yeah. but that place was beautiful and then I walked out into the fresh clean air and there were just so many happy citizens around me and I just turned around and there were so many food options that were all fantastic right um, and they're just also fantastic I don't remember the name of this pizza place but I guarantee all viewers if you go there and try all the pizza places I'm sure they'll just all be amazing that was great. Thank you. Plug ended. Yeah. Most importantly, what you'll learn is that in exchange for his testimony, he'll be as free as you and me by the end of today's trial. That two weeks after the attack, he was caught by the police. That they threatened him with 10 years. But that just his testimony today, all of that jail time goes away. Even more members of the jury today, you'll hear from Miss Witty. She's someone who's worked on the show, and what she'll tell you is that she never saw my client, Miss Leapheart, interacting with Mr. Watt. That she- so, uh, Miss Witty is Melissa Watt, who's back there sitting on the bench in the uh, on the, the left side or on the right side of the courtroom. The left side, of the, you know, she's sitting on the bench there, and yes. um, she was. My memory is that she was added for this final round. Um, so this part that you're 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 adding in your opening was actually off the cuff or at least something you planned right before the round is that right that's right i just remember it was like an awful affidavit for the defense but i had to like direct her and i was like what is this like can i make her a hostile witness after like everything that happened at nationals (laughs) maybe not (laughs) um and then i've also heard that like every tvc competitor that that has had to do the extra direct has lost I don't know if that's true. Oh, that's so interesting. I hadn't I hadn't considered that. So let's like everyone who gets the cross wins. So in 18. Nick did an extra cross for sure. I right, remember he was on defendant. the podcast and he was like, You're a sucker if you choose direct. Because it was the defendant, <laughs> right? And then this year he got the extra cross. And then in 20, right, because prosecution has won. And then in 21, defense won. And but she got the extra cross. That's so interesting. All right, we should edit this out that way. No one gets to see it for next year. I don't want it <laughs> because that would be bad. I mean, I'm sure people yeah. have noticed by now. Uh, the host didn't notice, so maybe not. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, just to balance the case better. Jeez. <laughs> Yikes. Yikes. Hey, I, was, I was like, I was a co author. I'll take some oh, of really? the that. You, you added Witty? You added Miss Witty? Not this year. I wasn't. I wasn't a co author oh. this year. I, I co authored. So, 
I've only been in this role at the law school. I was a coach of the law school since I graduated. I've been in this role since 2020. So I helped in, in 18 and 19. I was on the staff, but um, in 20 and 21, I was the, the actual co-host with Justin. And so I can't, I won't take any bad stuff about this case. I won't take any, I'll take praise, but none of the, none of the negative, none of the critiques, but for 20, <laughs> 20 and 21, I'll have to take the, the L on those. But I'm re- remembering that correctly, right? See, like, that's the, correct. The, like the Miss Witty, like direct affidavit, like it's just all cross points for the, for the prosecution, right? I actually even went back. Um, I was thinking about it like maybe a year or two afterwards. Uh-huh. I went back and I was like, what could John have even done with this witness? <laughs> and there was really nothing. There was there was not know. a lot of good defense facts other than that they they didn't see anything too bad. Oh, right. It was like a ghost bad. direct, really. You just oh. went up and asked what they didn't see, which is about all you could have done. Oh, wait. I, I thought of something recently, actually, about this case. I don't think there was any proof that Eli Watt was like an employee, right? Like he says he's an employee, but like he doesn't have anyone, like no one in the case confirms that he's there, right? So you're saying you could have run like a- Like he's just- Wasn't their defense? Yeah, like he just, like he says he's an employee, like that basic fact, and like no one agrees with that. Cause like the the Miss Witty, just for like background, I think she was like an employee as well on set or something like that. So you could have like had put her on the stand to say like he literally wasn't even there. Yeah, and then I think the cross is like, do you have like a pay stub? Do you have like any proof that like you actually worked at this place? Because he says a bunch of stuff like, oh, I like brought her cocaine or something like that. You know, you know what's so funny? You know what's so funny about that? Like, I'm sure the two of you will will agree with this. In college, that's that would be totally acceptable. But in law school, if you did that, that would be like, oh my God. like <laughs> be sanctioned so hard. They would like they would like. Uh, permanently ban you from the tournament if you did that. You can't take advantage of negative space on di- on direct. Really, I mean, you can oh, sometimes. Really? It's so like there's just not many rules in law school, and and one of the unwritten rules is that it's frowned upon to take advantage of negative space in on direct. I had no idea, and I think that happened nationals that year too, right? It was like, like, uh, like when it was like the empower milk thing. And it was like, did you see them do anything before like they went to the back of the store? And it was like, no, like they didn't grab a shopping cart. They didn't grab like a bag. They didn't even like say, I don't, I don't know. It was just like a bunch of like, no, no, no's I, I thought. Right. But yeah, no, that's interesting. Saw my client, Miss Lee Park, hand $7,500 of cold, hard cash to Mr. Watt. You use the phrase cold, hard cash like a lot of times in this trial. I like do. Cold, cold hard cash was like your go-to. The cold hard cash. There were no pictures of the cold hard like, cash. Like That's the Miss, the Miss Witty <laughs> direct was just like you saying cold hard cash. You were like, did you ever see any cold hard cash? And did he ever have any cold hard That's- cash? That's probably a check mark. <laughs> That's probably a check mark that I lost. <laughs> that she never saw them have any private conversation, have any sort of relationship off set. Members of the jury, by the end of today's trial, you will know that Eli Watt is a criminal that cannot be trusted. In fact, today you'll hear from Ms. Lee Park herself. She'll tell you that she wasn't running out of time, that she wasn't worried about losing her job, that initially it was shocking, but that she knew that she was a lead actor on this popular show, that there were no way that the show's creators were going to fire her, that she calmed down that she didn't need to do anything. That's the truth. But the judge will instruct you today that it's not our job today to prove that truth. Because as the defense, we carry no burden. The burden of proof today, you'll learn, rests on this table and will never move over to this one. Yeah, Brandon Hughes helped coach us for a while and then I think he went to Cal. Cal Law, and then ended up helping coach them as well. Yeah, it's funny because uh, I think another member of the UCLA team, John Accardo, had told one of the one of the like my my years competitors, Megan Jones, who was doing the the under like the no not the undergrad the high school version of this uh, Gladiator, um, and and she ended up doing the same thing um, because that was like the whole Brandon Hughes thing, and I was like, oh, I mean, if it worked, because she ended up winning that year. Uh, like yeah. the high school version. I was like, I guess I, I got to do it too. Cause uh, if you do it apparently in final rounds, 
And then I ruined I ruined the streak. Uh, <laughs> so it's now two for three. Um, and he's the kind of guy that like he can say anything, and it just sounds cool. Oh my gosh! Like yeah. you watch him give that that opening or or closing in that round, and um, he was like everything he said. He runs around. <laughs> Yeah, with the beads, it's amazing. Yeah, you should watch like the remix one too. The yeah, that, I think that's version I think, of it. I think that's <laughs> off YouTube. I think someone took that down. I can't find it. So oh, actually, think that's true. There's many a times where I'm like, I want, I kind of am in the mood to watch that, and then it's not there. It ha- like I it's heard not there. From people at like the the undergrad program at UCLA that like some of like the YouTube links have changed or something like that. So maybe like a a permission thing as well. Because right, we, so I think- Bennett Bennett Dembski will know. Bennett, I know you're watching this. <laughs> Press pause and please email us the link to the 2011 uh, remix video. Thank you. He's like, he knows everything about that stuff. And that's important because trials like this one in a courtroom like this one, they are the bedrock. That was a plug. That was Let's a plug. That, again. That, was, that was a great plug. <laughs> that was a plug. <laughs> Instead, what you'll learn is that when Miss Rivers Leapheart walked into this courtroom, she was presumed and still is presumed innocent and that's important because trials like this one in a courtroom like this one in a courtroom like this one courtroom like this one, one more time <laughs> and that's important because trials like this one in a courtroom like this one they are the bedrock well we had like two Drexel Klein school of advocacy people in like the the box right yeah one was me yeah I was well wasn't Abby Heller and then like the president was wasn't he also there so the current, the former assistant director, Abby Heller, was a judge. Hmm. And our dean, Dan Filler, who is, in my biased opinion, the best dean in the country, um, was also there. I think he had a ballot also. And then, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I was, I was, I was winning. Right. I'm pretty <laughs> sure I got those, those really those nice. three ballots. I'm pretty sure I got your three ballots too. I think, I think that's right. And I think it came down to that moment right there because I'm not sure if Steve ever plugs the, the courtroom. So I don't think he does. Yeah, that was it. And for then me. I plug it a second time in the closing when I say, "Look at the ground," <laughs> but like, look at the words on the carpet. He just like unbuttons his dress shirt. It's just like a Drexel shirt underneath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. And it is important that they are able to prove every element of their charge today beyond a reasonable doubt. If they miss just a single element. What the law will require is that you find my client not guilty. And by the end of today's trial, that's what you're going to see. Because today you'll learn that their story, their case, rests on the word of one man, Eli Watt, a criminal that cannot be trusted. Steve, what were you thinking when he finished? Well, I lost that. Better go make it up now. Hope Dan's fun on direct. Uh, <laughs> I, honestly, yeah. Like, I, I knew I lost the, the over. So I was trying to think of ways to incorporate his material into my direct, my cross, that's con- or my clothes. That's constantly what you're thinking about when the other person's giving a speech. But over- overarching feeling of, I definitely lost that open. That was a fantastic open. It's probably, probably the best one I've seen at TPC. Yeah, so we didn't watch your opening, but I thought, I thought your opening was was great. It was really good, and the hardest thing to win in mock trial is the P opening. It's just really difficult, and um, especially when you're going against anyone who's as good of a speaker as John, it's really tough. Um, my guess is based on the outcome of the round, it was closer in the opening than than you know we're making it seem. Um, but I don't remember exactly how that how it broke down. So now we're going to watch the cross of the defendant. So I don't remember exactly what the rule was, but you got to pick Liz. Is that right, John? Uh, it was uh, it was just like the Rhodes Yale thing, and Justin just thought it would be funny. <laughs> right. Oh, that was the right. That was that year. Right. So that was the year because it was he just made it be Rhodes and Yale. Right. I do remember yeah. that. It wasn't just that year. It was that courtroom. Right. Oh yeah, shit. <laughs> right, it was. It was this this exact room. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, it's like Voldemort. Like we won't say what we're talking about, but everyone knows. Uh, this was coaching me about that too. She was like, "The mic doesn't carry as well in this room." Or something <laughs> oh like that. Oh my god. It, yeah, she was. Telling, I don't know if Dan was telling you anything. 
Dan was like just pra- like fixing his bow tie uh, before the trial. Yeah, I don't know if you know that. Dan was completely in character the entire time. Oh, he truly wow. was. That's he was wonderful. speaking to me as a British man named Eli Watt. So no, I didn't get any. Uh, I didn't get any groundbreaking uh, tips <laughs> or suggestions from that man as uh, it was just Eli Watt I was talking to. Hmm. Uh, I mean, Pretty I guess funny. he was really good. He was, I may, I might say the best witness in a final round at TBC. I'm trying to think if there's anyone who was better. I think he was the best. Um, I think he was the best. I, I would I, I, I'm, com- I'm comfortable saying he was the best witness in a final round. Um, he was so good on direct and he was pretty good on cross too. He got some laughs. It's my memory. Um, witness in a final round though did i did yeah i was a witness. Oh, wow so humble yeah. gracious That's yeah crazy. i'm a terrible witness what are you talking about i was horrible everyone who's watching this is probably like yeah because he was terrible that's why i didn't i was the worst witness ever <laughs> i mean i was i i was and rachel summers if you're watching this i was i was obnoxious on cross i'm sorry oh, no. <laughs> uh, uh but like i was okay i guess I was fine. I guess I think that year Justin thought it would be cool to have Top Guns be the witnesses, but I'd never done. I've never been a witness before that. Um, oh, really? Wow. Maybe like once or like you know a one-off tournament, but not really. Not in anything that mattered. And mm. um, yeah, it showed. Dan was better. <laughs> yeah, Dan was definitely better than me for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so you didn't get to pick your witnesses. How did you feel? Uh, getting Liz, were you like super pumped? You knew she was going to be awesome. You knew she's really smart, obviously. Oh, Ooh. yeah. Yeah, kind of like what I was saying before. I just like respected her a lot, respected her opinion a lot, had access to her for like that like 30 minute prep period, which I tried to make the most of. Um, and then I, I will say Dan being on the other side wasn't my my favorite moment because I had, I had actually crossed Dan before that, that same tournament. Um, and it was a very similarly painful experience, very fighty witness. Um, and I also have like a bit of PTSD facing Dan because I remember hitting Rhodes junior year at downtown and Dan just like absolutely smacked me down that, that tournament. Um, and so it was very sad. And I was like, my one hope this tournament is I don't have to face Dan in any way, fashion. And then I added him as like a, the opposing witness twice in a row, which was unfortunate for sure. <laughs> Steve, what did you, like, obviously Liz is really smart and really accomplished. Did you change your strategy at all, knowing it was going to be her? Yeah, of course. So when you're prepping for a tournament like TVC or Top Gun or something like that, you do as much research about everyone as you can. And you got, if you're, if you're a crazy person like me, you got a notebook that reads out how to beat every person. And then subsequently, how you think that person thinks they can beat you and how to respond to that. So I play a rather crazy. crazy dumb what? Uh, a- attorney. So I, I made some assumptions about the assumptions that people would make about that. So I left a lot out there in terms of uh, objectionable material because I just, I just wanted to be able to make arguments. So I would make swing arguments. Um, I also knew that she had seen my case. So I, I clipped the last lines from a couple different lines of questioning on the cross where I did what could have been one question too many, something where I could get like fighting on. So I, I cut questions like that, knowing that she was on that side, but no, well, it wasn't a huge change. I mean, my, my strategy was very similar in those three rounds. Actually, this is the third straight round that I'm going as a prosecution attorney. I did it all day Sunday. Wow. Exhausting. Wait, what's in the notebook, Steve? What, what do you write about me? I want to know. Yeah, tell us. What'd you write about John? I mean, I knew that John was going to be uh, very performative and rather mm. theatrical and that it was going to be very difficult to beat him trying to play his game. So I would just do what I typically do, which is try to be as much of a, you know, very straight laced tactician as much as possible throughout the round, just to try to create a contrast. And that contrast was definitely there throughout the yeah. round. And we were both doing what we did so well that that's why it's a, you know, a four, three round where the last ballot is four, three. It's a style clash for sure. It absolutely was a style clash. Um, and two people doing two different styles, that are, but doing it really well, which is the coolest part about it. All right, let's get into this cross. No. Look, there are other. 
other ways to deal with that in the industry. You talk to your boss, they, you know, maybe they make you send out an apology or something. You don't, you don't have someone beat you up in a dark alley. Thank you for your time, ma'am. But we've got nothing further. Steve, you were writing like you were furiously writing during this round. Every second of this round, you're writing. Did you just have like, yeah. did sometimes as a competitor, I would write because I wanted people to think I was writing and I wanted people to think I was paying attention. Um, one of the one of the people I work with at trial just like takes notes the entire time because he wants the jury to pay attention. Um, he just like writes everything down that's being said. Were you like taking notes on just things the witness was saying that you were going to use against her? What were you doing, if you remember? I was writing my clothes. But mm. that's what I'm doing through most of this round is writing my clothes because my cl- we didn't spend much time in prep on the clothes. And so it had been built up, you know, doing it two times before, but there were, you know, there are kind of chunks that I knew I was going to do. But other than that, it was very responsive to the round because TBC, that prep period, it's hard to write two clothes on top of all the other stuff you've got to write. So yeah, I'm, I am unfortunately probably not as attentive as you want to be in an amped around where you want to be, you know, I know everything I'm going to do. I'm staring right at the witness. I'm paying attention. I, I am just a kind of feverishly writing this whole time. So uh, that, that kind of is like a nice segue into something I wanted to ask you. Um, and so you, you, you didn't have a closing written. And my guess is you wrote a lot of, um, you wrote your own stuff, obviously, at TBC. And is Cincinnati, I know Cincinnati has had a coach, but this year you had Julia with you, right? Who was one of your teammates at the, at the time. That's right. Yeah, uh, my uh, teammate at the time, now fiance, uh, Julia was right. my coach. Right. Um, and you uh, coached her the next year, right? Yeah, I coached her the next year. Yeah. We, we swapped roles. What she was, was that? A way better coach than me, <laughs> I have to say. What was that experience like, you guys coaching each other? It was fun. I can mean, she be there? Can she hear you? No, no, no. Okay, she, <laughs> you can say whatever you want. She's never going to watch this. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> it was fun. I mean, we write really well for each other's voices because we worked together for so long. I think that was the biggest advantage was that I could know that I could write one side of the case while she's simultaneously just like going at the other side of the case. And I know that when we flip the stuff, it's, it's going to be pretty similar to what I would want to talk like anyway. So that was, it was really helpful for, I think, both of us. Did you guys have any fights during it? Not when she was coaching me, but I was a bad coach. So I, I think we definitely had an argument about whether we were or were not going to use a piece of evidence. And I was, I was wrong, I, I will say. Miss Leopard, I'm looking for a number here. How many times did you lie to the police? Right after everything happened, I talked to them a couple of times. Did you, did you use that in the round where she saw you? Oh yeah. I use that all three prosecution rounds. That was, that was one of the first questions I thought of. And I just had to ask it. Did you, you care? always do it like without having walked into the well, like yep. just standing up it's kind yep. of every time. Like Cause then it, I'm, I'm like stalking around the well as they give whatever bad answer they're going to give me that question. Did, did, yeah. um, did she knew it was coming though? Right. Because she, yep. You were just like, whatever. Yeah, of course I'm going to keep asking. There's no bad answer to that question for me. What would you have said if you were the witness? I don't know. That's a tough question. I mean. You just lean into it and you sit twice. Just lean into it and twice. Right. I think twice is is the right answer. I think she gave the best answer you can. But the problem is, as you're about to see, I walk through and it's, it's at least three lies to at least three groups of people. So to say that you lied twice, I guess, I suppose one of them is the FBI, so that's not really the police, but sure, I mean, two, two is a good answer. As yeah, as any. I think the best thing you can do with stuff, I mean, this is obvious, but you just lean into that stuff and just like give it as little airtime as possible. After everything happened, I talked to them a couple of times. And I said some things that weren't true. A couple of times, is that two? Two times you lied to the police? Two times. I mean, once to the police, once to the FBI. Once to the police, once to the FBI, once to the doctors that were there at the hospital when I, you got taken. I told taken... the doctor I'd been hit by some people in an alley. That, that's what happened. Let's talk about what you told the police. You told the police there were three attackers. Isn't that right? I give you a lot of credit 
there for she interrupted you a little bit and you just like did not were not even phased you kept with like you were nice and slow you didn't take the bait to try to get, get, get like engage with her on that i thought that was really smart to not to not to not engage with her on that let's talk about what you told yeah me. i mean i I don't think there's any good way to respond Please, to that. I mean, if I just FBI keep going and to- if she stops talking pretty quickly, then it, it worked out. Um, I knew I knew she was going to try to run on this cross. The doctors that were there at the hospital when I, you got I told taken- the doctor I'd been hit by some people in an alley. That, that's what happened. So there's like a really uh, cool moment, like in Rahul's Top Gun 15 round, where a witness does something similar, and he's like, "There's no question pending." <laughs> did you did you did you think about did you think about James like Perez did that to Rahul to to Rahul's team, actually like in like a UCLA UCI round I think oh really someone like started answering before he was done his question yeah yeah and he was just like there's no question pending no question pending, um, and I tried that and I couldn't pull it off, <laughs> but yeah, yeah I wonder if he got it from that. I wouldn't have been Maybe. confident enough in the moment to to do that. I would do what you did, Steve. I would have just kind of let her say it and not done anything about it. I thought I thought it looked good. I think it's something Rahul can pull off, not me. Yeah. <laughs> he did it. He was really good. Yeah. About what you told the police. You told the police there were three attackers. Isn't that right? I was worried that with everything that had happened. I didn't want people to know that it only took one person. So I... I'm going to direct the witness to answer the question. Yes. I this is were... crazy. This part is crazy. You like turn, Steve, Steve so you like to Justin, you're like, what? What <laughs> happened here? I, I, we're not watching the cross of Daniel Elliott, but Daniel Elliott was fighting a lot too. And Justin never stepped in for me. What's going on? I didn't want what happened? To what would you talk to? What would you say to Justin beforehand? <laughs> he was like, I, he was like, "Look, if you, if you, if you come to UCLA, <laughs> if you come to UCLA, I'll cut Liz off." Yo, yo, I'll throw you the round, bro. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I, I wanted to, as you can see, like I shoot a look over to Justin. I was pretty surprised. I wanted to be able to, to show that I could, uh, that I could do witness control. I feel like it, that's an opportunity. It's not like something that's you know taking points away from me. And that kind of question, I knew I was going to get a fight on. And I had, you know, kind of a prepared control about how, I'm, you know, not asking her why she said that, asking her what she said. But I, I guess I didn't have to do it. Yeah, I mean, the fact, the truth is, in real life, witnesses don't get to talk. They're not allowed to. Like, I've tried five cases now, um, not on my own, but with, with people at my law firm. And... Um, Every single time, like as soon as the witness starts to say yes and then explain, the judge cuts them off. There's no, there's none of that. It's not allowed. Like the judge has a job to do. They're trying to get these the jury out within the time they promised them. They're not trying to keep them there for weeks. So they're not like like none of that. Not allowed. So I I I, I like when judges do that in competitions. Um, Regional thing. Say that again. Is that a regional thing? Like whether the judge lets the witness talk? I don't think so. I feel like it's it's like the non-responsive thing. Like in LA, they really, really like it when you object non-responsive, like move to strike. And I feel like in other regions, they're like, what did you just say to me? <laughs> that is so disrespectful to make that objection. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've practiced primarily in, in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, but I've also like, for example, during the pandemic, I was in South Carolina to try a case. And um I don't know. In my experience, it's just a real life thing, not really a geographical thing. Um, and I'm sure some regions and courts are, are more sympathetic to that than others. But so I think in real life, witnesses don't get to do that. And one, also don't have like the same incentive, right? Because like in a round, you're trying to like mess with the other attorney, especially like if you don't if you're not scored, like in, in this format. Um, depends. So I think it depends. It um, my first year I got to cross, I tried a case against Johnson and Johnson and um, they had their expert and their expert wanted to talk, 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 every single question. And it was hard. And I think the jury was frustrated with him um, because, and the judge was not as frustrated with him as I would have liked, but still frustrated. Um, so it's just, just the way it goes. With everything that had happened, 
I didn't want people to know that it only took one person, so I... I'm going to direct the witness to answer the question. Yes, I said there were three people. You said you could see all three of these people's faces? Yes. You said all three of these people, you identified them as Latino men? Yes, I thought they were, I mean, from everything, yes. None of those things are true, are they, Miss Leopold? I mean, at the time, I didn't know that all of them weren't true, but I mean, I guess now I know, yes. You said at the time you didn't know they weren't all true. You spoke to the FBI a month later, isn't that right? Yes. Oh, when Agent Shu had asked you some questions, you told him those same three lies, didn't you? Yes. He handed you the police report that you had signed, and he said, is this accurate? Yes. You said, yes. Yes. It's I all accurate. I stand by my statement. Yes, obviously I wasn't going to say that I lied to the police. Not until they told you they had video and they knew you lied, right? Yeah. So good. Uh, what was she the gave me perfect segues into my lines of yeah. questioning both times. I mean, the first was time really I was good. moving from you lied to the police to you lied to the FBI, she gave me the at the time segue. Well, let's talk about it a month later. And then this time it's... Uh, you know, you, you lied until you got caught. Essentially, that was the next point. And, you know, I wasn't going to tell them that I lied to the police was uh, that was that probably wasn't a great answer. Yeah, when you're going against a, a good cross examiner. Sometimes the tendency, I think, is to like, you have to fight because they're good. I think it's the opposite. You're going against a good cross examiner. Don't fight. Like, let them like, let them just like give their cross. And like, don't give them, don't give someone like you who's really smart and listening and adaptive a chance to do that. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, and you can get your jabs in if they slip up or if they give you room for it. But generally, just like, yes, no. It's not as effective as if they're just saying yes, no, and everything. They started asking me questions. They, they said they knew. I, I, I told them what happened. That's right. You, you caved in. You told them the truth. You told them there was only one attacker now, right? Yes. You told them you couldn't see their face. Yes. You told them it wasn't three Latino men. I told them I didn't know what race or gender the person was. I told them it was one person. And I told them that that person took me into an alleyway and beat me 15 times with a pipe. Let's talk about why this all This is kind of good. <laughs> I feel like I hear emotion there. She was really good. That yeah. was one of my takeaways. She was, has she witnessed, like, I'm sure she has witnessed before, but does she, was she a witness in college at all? Not that I remember. I know there's a picture of her uh, playing a witness with a huge scarf on, looks like a character on the Gladiator website from her high school days, but mm. no clue if she played any witnesses at Yale. Mm. Yeah, she's really good. Um, yeah. She's credible. Um she sounds great on the stand. She does this thing where she like starts a sentence and then cuts herself off midway through the sentence and just says, no, we're like, yes. Um, it's actually pretty effective. Um, I'm sure it's something she's doing deliberately, but I, I thought she was great. Because of a tweet you made, isn't that right? Yes. That tweet's on the 19th? Yes. You didn't get attacked the night of the 19th, did you? No. I the 19th. I don't know how many people have actually seen that tweet. It wasn't until a couple days later that it blew up. Not on the 20th did you get attacked? No. Not on the 21st? No. Not on the 22nd? No, it wasn't until the 24th. Five. Oh, this is one thing I guess I, I kind of want to point out because it's something I see people messing up in mock trial is when you're doing a timeline, when you're moving from left to right, the natural tendency is to move your body left to right. But what you should actually do is move from right to left since you're moving from left to right in the jury's view. So when you're moving chronologically, it's kind of counterintuitive, but that's something that I just noticed that- Oh, I, that's interesting. That that. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and I wonder how that would play out on Zoom, depending well, on- Then you have to flip it again because right. Zoom is, is reversed. So you have to move from this side to this side, even though that feels like the opposite of what's right. Right. I forgot something about real life mock trials. Like, the whole thing about like standing away from the jury box so that the witness can't i just have completely forgotten that that's the thing like where you stand on direct and cross and it and all that started so, like the yeah we're all gonna have to 
we're all gonna have to relearn that in the spring at some point. Yeah. All yeah. of us, all three of us. I mean, we're gonna have to like put some serious time in to just reorient ourselves to all that stuff. Um, Do you think we're going in person for the spring? I will predict that there is. You're in with them, right? You're in with the. Yeah, I'm in. Locals. I'm kind of yeah. in. Yeah. You know what's happening. Yeah, don't tell anyone. But <laughs> <laughs> cut the video. <laughs> I, no, I do think stuff's going to be in person. I definitely mm-hmm. do. I think okay. that I think the um, I think the sense. First off, I mean, the reading is out of control. I hope we can use this platform f- to do some good here, and I hope you will join me when I say the reading is out of control. Mm-hmm. And unless you guys were doing a really good job of hiding it, I don't think your team's read, um, and my teams didn't read either. And the reading is just out of control. It's not. It's not real it's not anything it's you're just reading a screen and like we tried really hard at battle the experts to curb that by putting a rule in place that saying we're going to tell the judges to, to police it i'm not sure how well that worked i'm sure it didn't really work that well because how can they police it um i'm just i i do think we're going to be, be in person i think people are sick of being on zoom i think coaches are sick of teams reading against them and I think we're just kind of over this. So I do think there's going to be some stuff that's in, that's uh, in person for sure. I feel like Zoom kind of, it narrows the gap a little bit between like competitors for sure, especially like if they're going to read and everything like that. Yeah, absolutely. Especially in a format like a trial by combat or a Top Gun. Like yeah. if you're memorized for that, you have a big advantage. And you guys know, like I'm sure even the people that you were competing against at combat were stumbling and messing up and, and, and not necessarily being as succinct and concise and precise as they normally would be. But when you're reading, it doesn't matter how tired you are to some degree, at least. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm over it. I was like this time a year ago, I was for it. I was like, it's kind of cool. Like the technology and the whole thing done. I'm done. I don't want to do zoom anymore over it. How do you guys feel about it? I've enjoyed the Zoom mock trial. I think that there's a couple of advantages. Obviously, some of it sucks, but they're, uh, being able to use the technology is really cool. The, what you can do with the monster divs, the fact that any demo that someone brings, I can now flip your demo. I could just because I can screenshot my laptop, um, whereas you can't, you know, can't live print a demo to flip it in a, in a round. But the, uh, I don't know. There's obviously drawbacks to it. I don't like the reading. It's clear when people are doing it, and I'm not sure how often judges are noticing. Never. They're never noticing it. They can't. I, yeah. And, and I'm worried that at, at best, they're reading something that they and their coaches wrote in advance. Obviously, I'm worried that there might be even worse things, uh, like, like a Google Drive that could just be sitting there open. Um, but... Yeah, so I, I also am ready to move back to in-person, but I'm a little scared about how to do that. I'm not sure I know how to walk around a well or where to stand anymore either. John, did you do any in-person stuff at Harvard? Yeah, yeah, my first year. Um, we did Tyla. Uh, and that was with Joy Holden and Jackson Laughlin. I, I don't know if you know it either. They were yeah. both All-Americans at their schools. Um, so like that was like a really stacked team. I think we're really excited for nationals. Um, but then everything got canceled. Tell, uh, tell, I want you to, to make the announcement on, on WatchMock, who is Harvard's Tyler team? Harvard's Tyler team? I'm, yeah. I don't know. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not on the board anymore. I, I've been ousted. Come on, John. Ousted. We just give the power to two else. Um, well, who, who, who's I don't know. Who do you uh, think, who do you I, think I, it's going to be? I can drop this information. Steven Becker and Matt Bestman both made it to the semifinals of the Ames Moot Court competition, which is a really big deal. Uh, it happened like, the finals happened like yesterday yeah. and like Elena Kagan was there. That's awesome. Um, so I think they're probably going to be out of commission for this year, um, which is good news, I think, for a lot of schools. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, um, I think you and Sonali should go help them. That'd be, that'd be, <laughs> ideal. that'd be ideal. Go help them. They need all the help they can get prepping. Um, Take this semester off. That'd be fine. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, I, I will say I was disheartened by our round against you because I was like, man, we should have beat them. What's going on? And so I'm hoping like in-person stuff will 
let us, I don't know, just let us like fully showcase our ability and like create gaps and scores more easily or like more consistently. Um, Cause like I said, like you guys, like, I, like we were just thinking about it. Like how do, how do we even like beat your team? Like everyone was clean. Like everyone had really good content, very well coached. Like the, like there weren't that many objections to make. It was like very like UCLA ask in terms of like, it was like a really clean round. Um, UCLA ask is the best compliment you can get. I think <laughs> flavors of that and, and perhaps better in other ways. Um, and it's just like, how, how do you differentiate yourself against a team like that on zoom? Um, and I just figure like if there are more, more avenues to differentiate yourself against a, a really good clean, like maybe that's like a law school UCLA. I feel like an undergrad that was like the UVA vibe as well. Like just, impossibly clean just like very very clear and like very very i should retire right now like being compared to justin and toby and just it's just like <laughs> a fourth circuit judge yeah done. um yeah no i i just i think like on a zoom format i just feel like it's hard to hard to beat a team like that as as consistently as i would like um in like a in in person format candidly um which is which is why i would prefer in person just because you know steven doesn't know how to walk around a well i feel that's my chance to beat him. <laughs> Could be. Well, he's stalking around. Like he gets up, he's like, "I don't know where to stalk anymore." Like, right. <laughs> that's my chance. Like the the iron's hot. I, I need to strike now. But uh, he's just like in a court. He's just like in a courtroom, and he's like, "We call so and so." He just like takes out a camera and like puts it in the well. <laughs> like puts a mic on. <laughs> puts a studio light. Big ring light. Oh like, yeah. Uh, someone brings like the classic like white wall that everyone at UCLA seems to have behind them. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I, I need that. I need that to win. <laughs> you said in your industry, there are other ways you can deal with this. Your words were, there are other ways to do that. You can <laughs> send out an apology. Isn't that right? I thought that was so funny because you like went, I love when people like go back to the pad and like it's about, you think it's going to be like a long, like profound quote and it's like, it's like a sent. It's like one sentence. <laughs> it's like, and you said, you can send out an apology. <laughs> I always thought that was so funny when you did that. I also could have flipped the pad around. Like I was right there. I chose to walk in a full <laughs> circle around the table for no reason. It was great. These are the things that will be missing in an in person in round. Industry, <laughs> there are other ways you can deal with this. Your words were. There are other ways to do that. <laughs> and you said it like it was like so like it was so devious, like something that she said. It almost there sounded like you were about to say to the same that. thing again. You can send out an apology. Isn't that right? It was effective though. Yes. Obviously yeah. I didn't want to do that, but that's what I had to do. That's what I had to do. But it's not just that you didn't want to do that. They asked you to the very next day and you told them another really good incorporation. You do such a good job of listening to the witness and incorporating their answer and not deviating too much from your plan. And it's, it looks so smooth and seamless. It's really good. No, I'm not apologizing. Right. I just, like I said, I didn't want to do that. I had a right to make the statements I made. I didn't want to just cave, say whatever people told me to. But you knew fans were calling asking for you to be fired. Yes. You knew advertisers were calling, threatening to pull their money. Yes. The very next day, after you said, I won't apologize, the 21st, that's when you took out that cash, right? Yes. I, I take out cash because I try to you know, have as many transactions as I Excuse can. Excuse me. Can. The question called for yes or no. And then yes. strike the answer you can react I mean, in Justin's defense, the answer... I look back, I'm fuming. I'm fuming. Who are you, who are you looking at there? <laughs> huh? Who is that your coach? Like, who was that you turned around to look at? I don't know who was behind me. I was, I don't know who was there. I'm so pissed. (laughs) I never noticed that. (laughs) Oh my God. I mean, in Justin's Justin's defense, the answer was not even close to responsive. But I feel like Daniel was also being unresponsive. I don't know. Maybe I'm misremembering it. I'm, 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 I'm recently. I'm biased, but I, I, I thought Dan was being funny and not mm. evading the questions. That was my, that was my sense. Got it. The very next day after you said, I won't apologize the 21st, that's when you took out that cash, right? Yes. I, 
I take out cash because I try to have Excuse as many me. transactions as I Excuse can. Excuse me. Again. The question called for yes or no. And then yes. strike the answer. You can re-ask the question. Yes, I took out cash. That's a yes. The day after you said you wouldn't apologize, you took out almost 10 grand in cash. Yes, that's true. The day after that, that's when the press release comes out. Isn't that right? Yes. They said they were thinking about not renewing your contract. That's what the press release said, isn't it? Yes, that's true. You told them you didn't think they were serious, but this wasn't just lip service to the public, was it? They called you and they called your agent and told you the same thing. They called my agent and said they were putting out the press release. Um, they didn't say that the stuff in the press release was true, so I, I don't know how to answer your question. They called you. And they she called, called me out there and told you they were going to. I, I asked about four different facts in one question, and I don't know if you hear the end of her answer, but she says, "I don't know if that answers your questions." She did. I didn't know. I didn't notice. So did she say that? I, I think that's how she answered it. Yeah. I didn't say that the stuff in the press release was true. So I, I don't know how to answer your question. They called you and they called your agent and told you they were going to put out that press release saying they were thinking about firing you. Yeah, they said they wanted to give me a heads up, so yes. Well, that contract that they told everyone you were in jeopardy of losing, that was for millions of dollars a year, wasn't it? That's right. That's, I mean, it's my salary. Thank you, Ms. Leopold. Nothing further, Your Honor. That was a really, really good cross. And it was, yeah. it's all the stuff that's good about a cross. It's simple. It's organized well. You're listening. Um, it's, it's, it's really good. And I think it's, I think it was probably the turning point in the round, although it was close. So I don't, it's hard to say anything was the turning point because it was so close, but it was the high point of the round. I thought, how did you feel when you sat down? I thought it was, I thought it went quite well. I thought she had tried to run significantly on questions where it would hurt her if she did, you know, questions about the lying. I thought all that landed. Uh, the jury seemed to be pretty receptive, which is something that is a benefit of in-person mock trial. You can actually tell if the jury likes what you're asking, but they, they seem to be pretty receptive to that cross. So I felt great about it. I also had the lingering thought of, oh boy, I can't wait until they hear the biggest fact in the case that I didn't ask her a single question about. And so that to me, like the best part of the cross is, I mean, obviously it's a pretty good cross. Like I make about five points that are all pretty clear and I'm responsive. And that witness just has facts that are not going to be able to go over well on cross. I think that cross is just a check mark winner. So I just didn't ask her anything about the medical records that I use for several minutes on end, like or, or a couple minutes on end at least in the, in the close. John, how did you feel after? Wait, had I done the witty direct at that point? Witty was last. Yeah, I think I was just thinking about the witty direct, but I think also throughout the round, Steve and I had never competed. I think during our four years. Uh, and I was like, wow, this guy's pretty good. <laughs> this is going to be a close one. Because um, candidly, like, I think like the big, big names coming into that tournament, the two big names were like Regina Campbell and, and Sabrina Grande. And I think everyone was, at least I was a bit surprised when Steven, like he was fourth seed or something like that, taking on first seed Sabrina. And then I was like, oh, Sabrina, like I saw her like writing her stuff or like something for like the finals. And then like they were like calling like whoever was, third place or something like that and then they called Serena's name instead of Steven and I was like oh my gosh like what's going on like did I dodge a bullet there and then I think throughout the tournament or throughout that round I was just like oh boy <laughs> here yeah. we go and I, I think like you had kind of noticed or I, I had noticed as well it's just like it was going to be like a big style difference it was going to come down to like what do the judges like um and I was a bit worried because I had one of the judges previously in like a Sydney Gaskin round and she had like, did not like me at the ballot. But I was like, I think that's a lost ballot for sure. Um, so I think at that point I was, I was like, I, I don't know which way this round is gonna go. I have to do this really bad direct now. <laughs> yeah, I, I had never seen either of you do anything and I was just super impressed. The crazy thing is for both of you, cause I've now seen, unfortunately I've seen Steve a bunch of times in rounds against my team. And John, I saw you at TOC. And um, you guys are actually way better now than you were in this round, which is shocking and hard to believe. Um, but the two of you are like substantially more poised and you're, I think you're both more substantive now than you were then. And you were really good then, obviously. Um, 
And it's just a testament to how hard you guys work. Um, people, if you're unfortunate, if you're in the unfortunate position to be on a law school team where you have to compete against one of these two, it's just, it's not a fun experience. Um, but I thought this was a great final round. Really, really fun. Um, I have a couple of rapid fire questions for you guys. I know it's been a long episode, but I'm realizing as we do this, that I have two of the historians in some ways of our generation on the show. And I want to give you a couple rapid fire questions. All right, here we go. Who do you think is the best mock trial competitor of the last 10 years? Ben Wallace. John? Zach Fields. Zach Fields or Elizabeth Bates, I think, are my two answers. Okay. What's the best round of the last 10 years at any level? The Harvard I love Yale the Rose versus Har- Harvard, Yale fif- Harvard Yale 15? Yeah. John? I like Rose versus Yale 2019. <laughs> what is the result that you're most proudest of, that you're proudest of as a competitor? I think you said TOC, Steve. John, what, what about for you? Hmm. There was a 2018 orgs run against UC Irvine. Um, that was the year they got second uh, at nationals. And we ended up taking both off of them round three at orgs because UCI A and UCLA were just like button heads the entire, the entire like 2017 through 2019 because they had kind of like their class of like all-stars growing up and like hitting seniors at the same time that we were. Like they had Tristan Lim and Mudit, who's also at Harvard right now, and Dev Medekin and, and Sasha Youssef. And I think that was just like a really close round and it ended up coming down to closings. And we ended up taking plus one, plus one, uh, which I was really happy about. Who's your favorite teammate you've ever worked with? Julia. I figured you had to say that. Uh, favorite teammate. Well, that really puts me on the spot. <laughs> um, hmm. Chloe Connolly? If you could tell your college self one thing uh, to help you as a competitor, what would you tell yourself? Whatever you think is over the top is not over the top. Good advice. More about case theory. Think more about the team as well. Also good advice. Steve, I have it uh, from an inside source that you've uh, been nicknamed Sleepy Steve. What's the origin story of that nickname? Uh, So we had a tournament where I was a witness. It was the Syracuse tournament uh, fall of my 2L year. And the round started at 8 a.m., which is rather early. Uh, and I was supposed to be a defense witness, so I wasn't going to get up until pretty late. But the story gets a lot worse when you realize that I lived in Cincinnati, Ohio at the time in Eastern time zone. So it was 11 a.m. And they had to call me repeatedly until about 15 minutes before the round when I did, in fact, wake up and then get myself together. It got to the point where Justin had asked the tournament if Natalie could play both witnesses. So that, that's the origin of Sleepy Steve. What do you guys think is the best tournament in mock trial, whether it be law school, high school, college. Best tournament I've been to or like best tournament that's being hosted right now? It could be the, be the best tournament there is, whether it be a current tournament or one that's not being held anymore. Downtown, right? <laughs> Good answer. Yeah. Top Gun. Also a good answer. John, what are you doing after graduation? I'm um, clerking for two years and then figuring out where I'm going to go after that. Massachusetts and then San Diego, which is where I'm from. Do you know whether you want to do trial work or not? I think I'm interested in doing IP, um, but we'll see what happens during the two years. I, I just like kept all the offers open, so I have time to think about it. Steve, I've also been told by the same source as the Sleepy Steve thing that you've got sort of a dream job after, after you graduate big firm, um, some trial work. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, I've always wanted to do plaintiff's work, particularly class actions. So I will be doing uh, plaintiff's class action work, some antitrust, some 
uh, product liability, but mostly securities fraud at uh, Robbins Geller in San Diego. Oh, wow. So I'll see you awesome. there in two years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll have to meet up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, maybe, maybe do a rematch. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, so you both, we started the episode by talking about your last year of law school and your last year of competing. And the two of you have, are, are, are decorated. There's obviously, I mean, John, two-time All-American. Steve, you're a, uh, an All-American also, trial by combat winner, lots of wins in, in law school. Um, what's the goal for the last semester for both of you? How do you want to finish your law school careers or your mock trial careers? Trial career beats Steve. <laughs> Final round, Top Gun. <laughs> I wouldn't good. mind seeing John in a final round at Top Gun. That'd be a really nice way to, to cap it off. Although I'd prefer we not share titles like Rahul and Ben. Yeah, no, no. Um, I was thinking Steve gives us a nice conciliatory interview at the end. He's like, oh, it's only right that each of us had one win. <laughs> that, that's, <laughs> <nice>. that's right. <laughs> that's right. No, I mean, part of it's, yeah, part of it's up to me, part of it's not. I mean, I'd like to win Tyler. And then if I get to be the advocate at Top Gun, I want to see John in a final round of Top Gun. Yeah, well, uh, if we're lucky enough to be invited, I hope neither of you are there um, and neither of your programs are there. Just kidding. I want you guys to go. Uh, it's a really cool experience. It's obviously an honor to be there. And so you guys, both of you deserve to be in that field. So I think that'd be really cool. Um, thank you guys so much for doing this. This was a lot of fun. If anyone's made it to the end of this, you got to go do something better with yourself. Uh, I don't know how you're here for two hours, um, but this was so much fun for me. I hope you guys had a good time. Uh, thanks for coming on. And, Good luck uh, in your last semester of competing, but not too much luck, obviously. Benefit, benefit.